yes, uh, starting with, I am putting my full name. I am Dr. Sangha Mitra Bandupadhyay, and uh, I am a senior principal scientist at uh, CSR Indian Institute of Toxicology Research. CSR is known as is Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, which is located in Lucknow. And um, my, uh, I'm a neuroscientist. Yes, and the basic emphasis of my work deals with. Uh, neurotoxicology and neurodegeneration. These two are the basic ones. So, should I continue with my early days? Yes. So, I hail from a small town close to Kolkata. It's 35 to 40 kilometers from Kolkata. And uh, my parents, uh, Mr. Amul Banerjee and Mrs. Mukti Banerjee, they have been uh, the major inspirations. My father was a uh, employee of Calcutta Dock Liver Board and my mother was a homemaker. Nonetheless, uh, my mother, she's, she was a, she is still, I mean, my father passed away a few years back, but my mother, she is the source of uh, all my inspiration in my early days because she's a voracious reader, she's a fearless lady, very daring and her main motto of life, her sacrifice, her encouragement, support was absolutely emphasized upon the education of my sister and the sister and myself so yes uh, she has obviously both my parents but she has a huge contribution to where i am which if you ask me i do consider that i'm an accomplished person so yes she has a huge contribution and my education uh, my schools schooling was at st joseph's convent which is in chandana so this is it regarding my very early days after that, I did my uh, honors graduation in chemistry and then post graduation in biochemistry from Calcutta University and my PhD from Calcutta University itself in biochemistry. And there, uh, my PhD mentor, who I need to acknowledge, obviously, uh, it was Professor Deepak Bhattacharya, and he was a he was a he was an expert, extensive peer in his field, a very learned person and very affectionate towards others, I don't know, especially towards me, and a very cordial person. And from him, I because now I hold, for several years now, I'm a, I hold a independent lab with several PhD students. So the nuances of uh, how to deal with students, research, everything, I'm indebted to my uh, PhD mentor, Professor mm -hmm. Bhattacharya, though rather his cordial, he, he was a very affectionate person, probably I cannot, uh, come to his extent. Nonetheless, the cordiality with him extends to such an extent that uh, uh, if Sir calls me, because he's an aged person now, Sir calls me, it's been more than 20 years back that I finished my PhD. He calls me from, he stays in Kolkata for any reason, at any time of the day, any part of the year, I'll be there in front of him at his door. So this is how the relation goes on. Uh, further moving from my PhD, I, my major postdoctoral research was at Massachusetts General Hospital, MGH, Harvard University, where uh, it was a turning point in my career, uh, where uh, initially during my PhD, it was based upon lipid biotechnology, dealing with fats and oils, which I have brought back when I have myself become an independent scientist in India, nonetheless. So in US at MGH uh, Boston, I used to be, I started doing, or I got exposure to Alzheimer's disease um, the, uh, and what I had been doing under the mentorship of my uh, postdoc mentor, Professor Jack Rogers, was understanding the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease, the neurodegenerative disease, which is very well known. And what, uh, as uh, one of the major milestones which I had achieved there, which is still being carried on, not only identifying novel mechanisms or pathogenic features that lead to Alzheimer's disease. I'm not going into so much of scientific details, as well as I performed a significant number of high throughput screens there, which led to the identification of several compound hits, which I've left US, it's been more than 15 years now. Nonetheless, those compound hits, which I have identified are still being worked upon and undergoing clinical trials at different phases so that they can be uh, they can come out in the market as drugs for Alzheimer's disease. So yes, this is one of the uh, major milestones of my life, which I had achieved when I was there during my postdoc days. So then after I decided to come back to my own country with the knowledge I have, and uh, 
I came back to India and for a very short span, I was at Sanjay Gandhi Postgraduate Institute of Medical Sciences where yes, uh, I landed with the, con uh, with the new concept or the new learnings which I had got there on neurobiology. And this is, I came to SGBGIMS and I started there, but that was for a very brief spell because uh, then I moved on to IITR, CSIR, IITR as an independent PI and there, there itself my journey started from 2007 as a scientist and then I recruited PhD students, they started working with me and currently obviously as it happens with promotion and promotions and all that I've reached the position of senior principal scientist. So that is what I hold now. And here also I continued with the concept or the knowledge gained in neuroscience and which I'm applying or I have been applying for toxicology. So I do, my lab does neurotoxicology, neurodegeneration, and it is so much associated with the society that how the environmental toxicants of our country mainly, so that is the reason for me coming back uh, for my country. So the environmental chemicals, particularly arsenic, cadmium, and lead, and a few pe pesticides, how they are affecting the brain and one of the major aspects which had uh, rarely been studied in our country is to identify, uh, to understand, to explore the cumulative effect, the effect of combination of these environmental metals, because we all are exposed to the environmental toxicants. It is not an individual one, not a single arsenic or a single lead or a single pesticide. We are exposed to a combination of all these. So it is a very tedious job and my students had successfully done it. So how these mixtures at different doses, different concentrations, very close to the environmental doses, how they're affecting our brain, particularly the developing brain. And because of my experience and expertise in Alzheimer's disease, which is a known, it's a geriatric disorder, aging disorder. So how these aged people, the brain of the aged people, as well as the developing brain, the ones who are in there, uh, so using animal models and cells, for very young children, how it could be. So uh, we correlate from our animal models to the human beings that how the brain is getting affected. That is what uh, my lab had been doing and still continuing to do. And just going into the a bit of the detail on the scientific aspect that we particularly see the different types of the cells of the brain, the neurons, the astrocytes, the oligodendrocytes, all these glial cells together, how they are getting affected by these environmental toxicants. The different, because we have different, and we have different domains in our brain. We have the hippocampus, cortex, cerebellum, each of which regulates or directs a particular behavioral aspect or particular functioning of our uh, human physiology. So how these different regions are getting affected, how the cells are um, undergoing aberrant uh, uh, functioning. So these are the aspects we see with the toxicants. Typically, we call them signal transduction and signal transduction and me mechanistic aspects. And then finally, what we find is that in order to match the effect of these environmental toxicants with the human behavior, so we have these animal models which we try to mimic with the human behavior, and we find we identify the cause which of these toxicants are causing more, which particular dose could be more harmful. So there, and uh, a very significant, which is, in fact, probably we'll talk of societal aspect later, that how these translate into um, the observations or the identifications and data that we obtain. First of all, yes, we publish them in peer-reviewed journals of very good standard. We do patents. Uh, we uh, formulate products in collaboration with other institute. And more than that, the societal impact is, for example, we have a particular toxicant, a heavy metal toxicant, and uh, the government regulatory boards have a particular cutoff value, or this is the threshold value beyond which you cannot go, which is termed as permissible values. So in contact with us, we find that even the perm within the permissible doses, these environmental toxicants may be having significant neurotoxic effect. So it's a give and take between the government regulatory agencies also. So they take input from us and we suggest them Secondly, it's a big, the reason why we collaborate with the clinicians also. We have very good hospitals. As I said, so my experience, um, I, uh, I stepped into SGPJ MS after uh, returning to India from US. So with SGPJ, I have uh, a big collaboration where 
uh, we uh, so with the pediatricians, the neurosci the neuro uh, neurologists there, and the geriatricians that how these so for, I'm just giving a particular example that the farmers are exposed to the pesticides, and what happens is that the woman who is in, who is pregnant carries the I mean the child is with the women, so the when the child is born there are some behavioral aberrations which are observed the farmer himself or herself shows behavioral aberrations so in fact they come to the clinicians and the clinicians fail to identify because there are no reasons why this should be happening no genetic problems no other issues so yes then it's a they come to us and we correlate in this manner that yes the pesticide exposure at these doses and finally steps are taken so that these can be taken care of also. So these are the, these are the societal impacts. And um, yes, I would like to add to this that it's been 15 years I've come back to my country and already uh, the happiest part uh, which happens other than these uh, social aspects in terms of a uh, career is that I already have eight PhD students who have been awarded. And uh, one of them is doing very good in, in our field itself in neuroscience at Canada. Six of them are Again, uh, they are doing their best in US. And one, my latest one, one of my students, he has uh, joined a multinational company in India itself because he has, uh, for family issues, he doesn't want to go. So these and six more, I have six to seven more PhD students still running. And uh, exactly, they are, uh, we are, it's a very good association we do have. And um, yeah, this is it. So coming to, as I said, so initially during my, uh, PhD days, it was typically not neuroscience. So I, sh I made a shift later on during my postdoc days. And yes, somewhere, no, first of all, coming to my family aspect, uh, I do not recall or typically from the family, uh, a, a neuroscience that I should be a neuroscientist, that, ins that ins inspiration or uh, that feeling did not come to me. It was after my PhD, I found that somewhere I was not comfortable in doing what I had been doing for the last, uh, for the previous five years during my PhD. So, because one thing is you have to, which I understand my students do, I'll just deviate a bit saying that my students, uh, one of my students is sitting here. She's there before me from seven o'clock in the morning and uh, they come very early. They stay very late. Uh, they stay till very late until very late. And sometimes I reflect on it because I am uh, not a very, uh, very cordial uh, mentor in the truest sense. And they get uh, the doses from me, so what in a frank sense. Nonetheless, I find, at times I find that the next morning it might happen that they won't be there, that uh, ma'am has shouted so much upon us the last evening. But no, what happens is that they have started loving the subject. So that is the reason why they can stay until and unless when their work is over or when they uh, feel it's completed. Because I don't come so, I'm sitting in my office, I don't come so early. Just now I found that several students are already there in the early. So that is what they love. So for me too, what I found is that lipid biotechnology, which I had been doing during my PhD days, it was close to my heart, but probably not closest to my heart. So when I started looking for my postdoctoral fellowships, I started exploring. And then at that period, I would like to acknowledge my husband also. So uh, he was in Boston previous, uh, before me. So he was the one, because he could understand my interest. So he was the one who linked me up to Professor Jack Rogers in uh, Mass General Hospital. And Jack sent me several papers and work in his field. He's a very accomplished person and a, he's a very nice person. Yeah, all my mentors were too good. So he sent me papers and he was one of the inspirations where I could, uh, I could link myself and found, I could understand that, yes, this is a subject which I should be exploring. And since you are talking of youngsters, that how uh, they could be role models. And uh, yes, I don't have any problem in saying, I don't in, uh, hinder myself from saying that I have been a role model for several people because uh, my family is not a research family, but seeing me, several of the family uh, of my family members of the next generation, as well as my neighbors, they have come into the field of research. None of them are in the field of neuroscience or neurodegeneration. Nonetheless, uh, they got the inspiration from me. They got the advice from me, the way I explored 
at a certain stage, I explored through reading and identified that which is the field I could uh, continue my life with, where I could become a peer with, an expert with. So they also got the message from me and they explored. My niece is in, uh, she's doing language. So uh, she understood that uh, that is where her field is, linguistics and language is a field. So for me, yes, I explored, I studied, I understood that this could be the field. And then somehow it got channelized with the support of the people who are around me. So for a youngster, I would always advise that uh, close your eyes and try to think what uh, you could, what could be your life, what could be the bread and butter, not only bread and butter, what could be the interest of your life which could sustain you happily. And then you identify it, explore it, uh, in the era, because in our times, internet was not so, uh, we were not so much uh, attached or obviously, you know, very well that the avenues were not there. But now, so go ahead, see to YouTube and read them. In fact, day before yesterday only, I had been called from a school, the 11, 12 standard students as a, as an, I had to give an inspiratory message. And uh, that is what I said, that start thinking, exploring, talk to peers in the field, identify what you would love to be doing. And that is what we do when uh, we recruit our PhD students in our institute. So in the interview, we first ask them the first question that what is your field of interest? And those students are recruited, not that he or she has to be very knowledgeable in the field, but those students are recruited who know what they need to be doing in their lives. Might be there's a lack of knowledge in that, which he or she can develop in the long run. Nonetheless, he has identified what he wants to do and he's reading on it the same as I have done in my life. Yes. I wanted to go beyond what I had been doing. For example, I'm just saying during my lipid um, uh, PhD days, lipid means fats and oils. So yes, I had gained knowledge on fats and oils because my basic is chemistry. And then I moved to biochemistry. So chemistry was a major interest and my work was more or less oriented towards the chemistry aspect or the technological aspect of the lipid and the fat aspect. So obviously it's not that interest that is, um, I was very much interested. The reason why, what I did is I applied it, incorporated the knowledge in lipid biotechnology, which I had obtained there and currently uh, my lab had my lab had been working, and currently also we work on how these lipids, because though it is a toxicology lab, typically environmental toxicants, we are allowed to do because we get extramural grants. Yes, I do have several extramural grants, uh, competitive grants, uh, had been running consistently, still running. So there, uh, through that process, what we did is how these lipids, the lipid relation with the brain. So during my PhD days, yes, I did not do the brain, but currently linking between my PhD interest and current interest, how these lipids or these fats and oils could be affecting the brain, that is what we studied. And very interestingly, one information I would like to give for which we have publications and grants as well, that it is known that these um, um, polyunsaturated fatty acids, omega-3 fatty acids, which we consume, the docosahexanoic acid, uh, I'm sure you all are aware, maxipan, all these capsules that you have. We found that more or less the doses that are being given, they do also have toxic effects on the brain. So this continuous, because I know several people for years and years and years, they go on having these capsules. So it's a no, because it is rather than having these uh, pro-cognitive, pro-memory, anti-dementia effects, at times the damage could also be significant. So that is it. So I can never say I do. Since you're talking, I'm reflecting on it. Obviously, that was my interest. What I wanted to do is um, I wanted to go beyond by applying my PhD knowledge in some other field, which is very much related to our physiology. So that is what it is. And uh, I did get support, as I said. So my mentors and uh, I've already mentioned my husband. These people had been a big support. Because my mother, for my mother, it was the early days. But later on, no, she's not a neuroscientist. She's not a researcher. It was only her mental support that I got, but not in terms of uh, academic support in the long run. Yes. Being in Alzheimer's for these several years. So for Alzheimer's disease, what happens is that uh, identification is, a uh, diagnosis is very difficult. So probably if I'm not wrong, it's only the MRI 
that can do the diagnosis of the disease. And that too, if your mother is showing early signs and symptoms, it is difficult, very difficult to identify because there is a particular one, two particular we call pathological hallmarks, amyloid beta and neurofibrillary tangles, which get deposited in a particular domain of the brain, which leads to Alzheimer's disease-like pathology. When the, uh, this AB, all these proteins, these bad so-called, in a very simple word, these bad proteins and peptides are in a very small amount in the brain, MRI probably will not be able to identify it. So um, I, that is what happens. So when the situation comes that the MRI is being able to diagnose it, by that time, the person has gone through quite a, a significant uh, stage of Alzheimer's disease and dementia as a reflection. But, and so now it, yeah, people are trying to do some, uh, as it happens, diagnosis for this disease, typhoid, et cetera. You take the blood and you identify this typhoid. So we are working on it so that diagnostic tools could be identified, but somehow it's not happening for Alzheimer's disease, it's very difficult. So what the clinicians usually do is they give symptomatic treatments. So just for memory loss, okay, this one, because they target mechanisms within the brain which are typically not for Alzheimer's disease because there are no drugs which have been identified. Uh, if people claim also it is difficult to, um, acknowledge the fact that for Alzheimer's disease, a particular drug is available, probably nobody can tell it. Yes. So coming to what I had been doing in uh, uh, Mass General Hospital, that all these facts are there in mind, that usually they give ibuprofen, there's something known as donepezil and memantin. That is what they, I'm sure your grandmother and your mother have been given these memantin and donepezil. But these are, none of them target the typical pathology of Alzheimer's disease. The symptoms are some of the offshoots of Alzheimer's, offshoot, uh, what to say, symptoms of Alzheimer's disease or some of the downstream mechanisms we call the neurotransmitters. That is what these drugs started. So yes, what I had been doing is I had tried to, I mean, I started there, I did a high throughput screen of, it was more than uh, 100,000 drugs. So we, uh, we had, uh, because obviously we do, in fact, in India also, we do have several of these, but my exposure, for, exposure first to these high throughput machines was in Mass General itself. And there we screened, I used to be screening, it's I, it was not we, because it was me alone who used to be doing. And more than 100,000 drugs I screened. And these drugs were, uh, some of them, yes, they were the drugs which were used for memory loss, and some of them which could be directly targeting the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. And yes, I mean, it's 15 years means clinical trials take several and several and several years because clinical trials need to go through se several phases. And I left the place when it just started. So first it was a cell-based assays, just the brain cells. Then it goes to the animal-based assays. Then you go to humans and there are different sorts of trials which are uh, done in collaboration with the clinical uh, clinicians and the scientists, which finally leads to a drug. So yes, these drugs, which we had, and the hits, as I said, so a few hits which we had obtained from that. Point one is that, which again relates, the reason why coming to my institute, I related my study with Alzheimer's disease is the heavy metals. Uh, aberrant exposure to metals or deposition, because when we get exposed to arsenic, lead, cadmium, and all these heavy metals, we found that they get deposited in the brain. And these um, aberrant and excessive deposition of the metals is one of the key reasons leading to Alzheimer's disease. To this extent, I'm just giving an example that in a, it's long back in a mine in China, they had found that uh, the workers had been exposed to uh, suddenly young workers. I mean, less than the, in their less in their forties itself, they started showing symptoms of dementia. So initially, it could not be identified. And obviously, mine workers who are going to run after them to identify what happened. They passed away very early, and their postmortem brain showed that they had depositions of these um, copper, lead, and all these heavy metals in their brain, which led to Alzheimer's disease. It was identified later on. So, so, so what these compounds which I had identified and which are still undergoing clinical trials are the ones, several of them are targeting the heavy metals. So trying to remove the cause that they are chelating the heavy metals, several metal chelators are used. 
Then we have the ones which are typically targeting the mechanisms because inflammation, oxidative stress, these are the typical mechanisms which start, which are the initial preliminary mechanisms for Alzheimer's disease. So those, I, if I'm not wrong, I had identified 12 compound hits of the 100,000 through all these, of which finally probably two to three are in a stage which would be coming to the market soon. Yes, which target directly the causes of the disease. So it was a good reminder and it's nice that you're saying it also. So what happens is that at a younger age, I'm sure you know because of the estrogen levels. So estrogen has a significant neuroprotective effect. Nonetheless, for menopausal women and postmenopausal women, the sudden change starts to happen. And because of the deficiency in estrogen level, the problems uh, become very, uh, it's, it's very stark and very much prominent in front of the eyes. If I consider Alzheimer's disease, and we do in young stages as well, not only Alzheimer's, all sorts of neurodegenerative problems when we try to identify. And um, since I do developmental studies as well as young adulthood and in normal adults, uh, if I do animal studies, for example, comparing women uh, of around 50 year age, and because after that the postmenopausal issues start coming, until then it has been found that women are less vulnerable for all these neurodegenerative problems, neurological problems, where the hormone estrogen played a big role. But later on, because of this sudden change or the sudden transition or loss in the reduction in the estrogen levels, things become quite difficult. The reason why uh, uh, the ones who do have, uh, some people, the ones who are aware, the ones who are aware, for example, people like us, that these sort of uh, sudden uh, change of, or sudden you suddenly you can't remember what you are, uh, what you had been uh, easily remembering five years back. These things are coming. So because we are cautious, probably we try to adjust to it. Nonetheless, it is seen that for women it gets difficult. For women who's not aware, he or she gets it gets very difficult for her to understand that why this thing is happening. So yes, the estrogen plays a big role here, and we have seen that compared to the male. At a younger stage, the females are less vulnerable, but at a later stage, it is. Now, coming to 30 years back, it was less of the consciousness that women should be taken care of, particularly in the Indian background. Uh, it was The situation was very poor. Nonetheless, I think if I consider uh, nowadays the middle, so-called uh, the afford people who can afford, the consciousness is increasing. And, uh, but overall, if I say, if I'm not very wrong, it's because of the estrogen aspect, uh, the cases probably for Alzheimer's disease or any neurodegenerative diseases of that sort, if a person is conscious, if the family is conscious, it is less for women. The reason why I'm just saying, or if it could be a suggestion, they say that 40 plus women, regular checkups and regular doses of, as I said, so, uh, the, um, uh, the Maxipa and all these sort of capsules, the omega-3 fatty acid capsules, they should not be taken uh, very uh, continuously. Nonetheless, if we get cautious at these stages, for women particularly, then the comparative status would be further better in females compared to males. Because, uh, for example, obviously, you can't protect your estrogen level other than doing a HRT after a certain stage. You can't sustain that. But however, the associated problems that might be coming because of estrogen deficiency, that could be taken care of. And this is a major reason, absolutely, what we have seen in our grandmothers, partially in our mothers as well, that uh, this sort of care had not been given at the stage where it was needed. Otherwise, if given, she could have sustained a very nice life. Yes, yes. Uh, I don't know whether women would be, uh, I mean, uh, would get angry with what I'm saying. They would call me biased. Nonetheless, I feel that it is the responsibility of a woman to keep herself good. It is, it is, it is not her priority to give everything to men, leaving little for him, a little for her. So that is what I feel that, yes, awareness has to be done and that awareness has to be coming from a woman itself. That is it. That, I should be taking care of myself. I should be taking care of women around me. 
that awareness has to be done. We do so. For example, for me, yes, when I started learning it, I take care of, I'm doing it for my mother, my associates, the lady who comes to my house to help me in my work, I do for her, her family, her young daughter also, who's around 40, I take care. So all these aspects I do within my domain, but it is done by me. So that is what I'm seeing. So uh, obviously awareness has to be given and rather than, rather than being so-called gender bias and all that, it has to be done by a woman itself. Very much awareness is needed, very much. In, in fact, I uh, obviously we all, because of our uh, status, et cetera, et cetera, financial condition, we live in a society where it's very strange that affluent women also, they are so less cautious. They, um, uh, but that should be coming from women itself. So that awareness that you have to be aware and you should be the person who, would, who should be spreading the message of awareness for all these sort of problems, menopausal, post-menopausal problems, because it can be, that is it for a 70 year. Nowadays, uh, if, a, if a, a person is taken care of and under, if he or she doesn't have uh, met uh, significant metabolic problems like blood pressure. My mother, I'm just going to my example. My mother had um, COVID and her granddaughter also had COVID at the same period, at the same time. Nonetheless, she recovered. She doesn't have any of these blood pressure, blood sugar, et cetera, et cetera, problem. She's an 84 year old lady. So that is it. So she's aware. I made her aware. My elder sister made her aware. Uh, the reason why she's sustaining her, she reads voraciously at this age. She talks to me about books. So it is her awareness, which she has done for herself and the associated uh, women around her. That is me and my elder sister. Yes. Uh, so my failure, and then first let me talk of success. That how I, de because I remember the points, how I define success. So my, I think success is not how many papers or how many products or how many drugs I brought into the market. It is to stay in motion, to stay motivated and to say no to failures, uh, to acknowledge the fact that there will be disabilities, but you've got to run with it. And that is what probably, if I consider myself successful, that is what has led me to what I am today. My perseverance, my persistence, because I come from a very simple background. So compared, uh, in relation to that, uh, my continuity, consistency. But there have been two phases in my life. I'm not going so much into the personal aspect of it, which uh, one was during just before my PhD and the other was just after my PhD. So there was a personal and professional overlap. And I found that I was sinking, okay? So, and what I defined as sinking was that I found that I am not what I am. The points, the positive points about myself, which I have said, the persistence, the motivation to run, to move, I found that it was lacking. And that feeling that I am not what I am, I'm deviating, I don't know what's happening to me. That was a significant failure of my life. And yes, it was again, the support of my family members and very close associates. Uh, I then obviously, probably there was something left in me that could be back. So I could overcome the failure. And these two had been, these two episodes have been the, uh, major lessons in my life to know that in order to be successful, how to deal with these failures. So that is what has happened. Nonetheless, after so many years, after 20, 30 years, when I reflect on it, which I do very often, uh, probably it was not such a, a big event. Nonetheless, uh, at that age, at that young age with uh, less relative maturity, I considered it to be a failure, which probably was not uh, so strong, I could have uh, considered it as a part of my life. Nonetheless, this is it. So failure is when you lose motivation, at least for a person like me, a person with a research career, when you lose the motion that you have been running with. So I tell my students, I tell myself, I tell the younger generation that every morning get up and run after the aims or move with the aims that you had been having the night before. So that is what could be the key stepping stone towards uh, getting rid of, fail of failures and moving with success, yes. After a certain stage for people like us who are into research, there is no significant demarcation between the personal and the professional life. There are so much overlapping and obviously it's because of uh, my motivation. As I said, so sometimes I believe that 
as I said, I always repeat that it's women who can do for women. It's women who it's a woman who can do for herself. And yes, my support system, which also I created, so that uh, I could lead a. Uh, um, I could sustain or the sustainability factor is high. And regarding with regards to uh, another big achievement I consider or a good sustenance or is my students. They are also doing so good. They are sustaining themselves with what they have achieved from my lab, sustaining in a very good manner. So that is an extension and extrapolation of my sustenance. And thirdly, mm, yes, um, at the end of the day, I feel happy. And I have my own, uh, now it's a point when I can decide my own leisure hours. It's I who decide. Previously, 15 years back, it was not I could decide. My situation decided my leisure hours, but now I decide my leisure hours. I consider the, the steering of my life is in my hands and I can move it in any manner. And probably that will be unhindered because I've reached an age and stage where uh, I don't think faulty decisions will be taken by me. So this is sustenance that uh, the steering is in my hand and I, uh, if I want, it can move. If I don't want, it won't move. And giving to society, yes, as I said, so um, all these aspects. Currently it's toxicology, uh, association with clinicians, et cetera, et cetera. This is giving. In future, this will continue. And moreover, one thing which I uh, what happened was that with the PhD days and postdoc days, so much into research and research, I love to read because I've inherited it from my family. So those things had gone slightly into the, uh, they, I could not continue with that. So again, I'm getting back to it, the reading habit. So uh, probably I could be a bit relaxed in terms of research because my lab, lab is going smoothly. My soon, senior students are taking care of my juniors, more or less it's come to a quite standardized. So yes, sustenance is uh, books, books now, books. Leisure time, reading, I, though I don't look uh, slim, but I'm a big gym person, which I feel is very much related to neuro aspects as well. And I guide, uh, I tell my gym mates that do it, you all have to do it. And for me, because I have this problem of uh, uh, extensive persistence, if, if it's at nine o'clock also at night and I leave my lab, I tell my gym manager they do it because they see the consistency in a person of my age also. They will keep it open for me at least for 45 minutes. So that is it. That is their reading books. And then I travel, we travel. That is these things. Currently, I'm reading after so many years, I'm reading Dostoevsky's uh, uh, Brothers Karamazov. So it's, it's a book and I'm just enjoying it because such intricate details are there. Obviously, it has got, got nothing to do with neurodegeneration or neurotoxicology. So this is it. This is this is how, as I said, so I decide my leisure hours. Yes. First of all, in terms of career, if I consider myself an expert or peer in the field, I would tell that, as I said, so I repeat, identify what your aim in life is. For me, it was a bit late, probably, and uh, uh, probably if I would have decided. Uh, from then on itself after before my graduate uh, during my graduation this sort of deviation may not have happened nonetheless it has not affected my career but for these younger for the younger generation the competition the professional aspects are so strong and if i consider career with the advent and coming of artificial intelligence which may take over jobs of human jobs to manpower jobs to such an extent that research could be a, a very strong field which would continue ever and ever with little manpower uh, being, I mean, the uh, artificial intelligence taking over it. So for research, start identifying, dot from your school days, college days, develop an inclination. You might be a, problem, um, a clinician, but yes, it's develop an interest towards research and that could be done, started from very early days, identifying what your inclination is, what you would love to do. And second point is that, as I said, so I cannot invite, I just, it's that uh, persistence, motivation, be in motion, you cannot, in, uh, you cannot imbibe this in a person. It has to come from himself or herself. Nonetheless, probably I have been a role model or inspiration for a few uh, who could 
uh, take this. So these are the two different. One is personal self, try to mold a bit so that you stay motivated. And the other is in research, identify what you aim at or what your life could be. Do it, go for research and do it at the earliest so that at the end of the day, you can uh, sustain yourself and lead a leisurely life.